Hi students, welcome to the lecture for chapter 2, Essential Chemistry of Biology. In this chapter, um, it's going to be a whirlwind overview of chemistry as it relates to biology. Um, we're going to be covering matter, elements, atoms, subatomic particles, which include protons, neutrons, and electrons, isotopes, electron arrangement, chemical bonds, which include ionic, covalent, and hydrogen bonds, um, the biological significance of water, acids, bases, and pH levels, as well as buffers. So biology includes the life, the study of life at many levels. And in order to understand life, we can start at the macroscopic level, which would be the ecosystem level, which is inclusive of many different types of organisms, and we can work our way down to the microscopic level of cells. So I touched on this in our chapter 1 lecture. Cells consist of enormous numbers of chemicals that give the cell the properties we recognize as life. So when you really look at what makes life possible, it actually comes down to basic chemistry. So here is just a visual example of what I was talking about. We have an ecosystem being an African savanna. You can look at the community level, which is consisting of all organisms in that savanna. You can look at a specific population, which would be a herd of zebras. You can look at an individual organism, the zebra itself. And you can continue to trace life down to the molecular level, which would be DNA, and the atomic level, which would be um, looking at a specific oxygen atom within that DNA molecule. When you take any biological system apart, you eventually end up at the chemical level. Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. This is pretty intuitive, and you should learn. You should have learned about this um, probably back in elementary school or middle school. So matter is found on Earth in three um, readily observable physical states. There's solid, liquid, and gas. So in this picture here, solid would be pebbles that you might find on the beach, seashells, the sand grains themselves, um, the rocks that form tide pools. Liquid, of course, would be that seawater, and gas would be um, in the air. Matter itself is composed of chemical elements, and elements are the substances that cannot be broken down into other substances, so they are pure in that regard. There are 92 naturally occurring elements on Earth, and you're probably all familiar with the periodic table, which lists all of those elements. The element symbol here on periodic tables would be in the middle. This would be C for carbon. The atomic number is above that element symbol, and the mass number is below that element symbol. There are 25 elements that are essential to life. Four of these make up about 96% of the weight of the human body. So oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, um, as well as calcium, make up a large portion of our body weight. Trace elements um, occur in smaller amounts, and many of these we have to consume from food. Elements can also combine to form what are known as compounds. So compounds are substances that contain two or more elements, and they're always in a fixed ratio. So there's always a certain amount of one element relative to the other elements in that compound. An example is common table salt, which is NaCl, water, of course, which is H2O, and glucose, which is a very important biological molecule, which is C6H12O6. And this formula right here is the human body. So um, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to memorize this, um, but this just shows again that hydrogen, oxygen, 
Carbon and nitrogen make up the largest portion of our body by weight. Calcium is also a big contributor to that, and these trace elements are also found in the human body. Each element consists of one kind of atom, and an atom is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties of an element. Atoms themselves are composed of subatomic particles. Subatomic just means below the atom level. A proton is a relatively large and positively charged subatomic particle. An electron is small and negatively charged. And a neutron is large and electrically neutral. So the names kind of help you out here. Proton, proton positive, neutron, neutral, electron is negatively charged. Most atoms have protons and neutrons that are packed tightly into the nucleus. So just as cells have nuclei, atoms also have nuclei. The nucleus is the atom's central core, and the electrons are what orbit the nucleus. Here we have a depiction of um, some atoms here. We have, in this case, two protons, two neutrons, and then two electrons. And again, these symbols just show that the protons are positively charged, neutrons don't have a charge, they're just beige, neutral, and electrons are negatively charged. Elements differ in the number of subatomic particles that are in their atoms. The number of protons, which is equivalent to the atomic number, determine which element it is. And an atom's mass number is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons. So you add the proton number to the neutron number and you get that atom's mass number. Mass is a more general term, it's just a measure of the amount of matter in an object. Some of you have probably heard um, the word isotopes before, especially as it relates to um, radiometric or radiocarbon dating, um, which help paleontologists determine how old fossils are. Isotopes are alternate mass forms of an element. So they have the same number of protons and electrons, but they have a different number of neutrons. So for example, we have carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14 here. Um, they all have the same number of electrons. They all have the same number of protons, but they differ in how many neutrons they have. So with carbon-12, there are six neutrons. When you add the number of protons to neutrons, you get the mass number, which is 12, hence the name of the isotope, which is carbon-12. With carbon-13, it has one more neutron, giving it a mass number of 13. And with carbon-14, there are eight neutrons present, giving it a mass number of 14. Radioactive isotopes are unstable isotopes. The nucleus tends to decay, which give off particles and energy. And radioactive isotopes have many uses in research and medicine. An example of that would be the PET scan, which is a positron emission tomography scan. Um, for radiometric dating, which is also known as radioactive dating, it's a technique that compares the abundance ratio of a radioactive isotope to a reference isotope in order to determine the age of that material. And there's a handy web link here if you would like to learn more about how radioactive dating works. So when a cell takes up a radioactive isotope, 
that isotope's location and concentration can be detected because of the radiation it emits. Thus, radioactive isotopes can be used to trace the fate of atoms in living organisms. And that is how um, radioactive isotopes are used in PET scans. Here's another web link if you would like to explore um, more information about how PET scanning works. Okay, moving on to electron arrangement and the chemical properties of atoms. Electrons are really important subatomic particles because they determine how an atom behaves when it encounters other atoms. Electrons orbit the nucleus of an atom in specific electron shells. If you've taken a high school or college level chemistry class, you're probably familiar with those electron shells and um, how important it is to determine the number of electrons in an atom. The number of electrons in the outermost shell are what really determines the chemical properties of that atom. Electrons are found around atoms in fairly predictable locations. Two are found in the first shell around the nucleus. Eight are found in the second and third shells. And the inner shells are always completely filled before any electrons go into the outer shells. So you're not going to find an atom with one electron in the first shell and three electrons in the second shell. There's going to be two electrons in the first shell if there are two or more electrons around that nucleus. So shells may not contain all the electrons they possibly can, um, and this determines the chemical properties of the atom involved. Here are depictions of the atoms of the four elements that are most abundant in life. You see an electron here around a hydrogen nucleus. Um, the presence of electron is denoted by this yellow circle. If there's not a full shell of electrons, there's going to be a white circle. That means that there's a place for an electron there, but there's not currently an electron around that nucleus. So again, that first electron shell, it can hold two electrons. The outermost shell can hold eight electrons. Chemical reactions enable atoms to give up or acquire electrons in order to complete their outer shells. So the way my college chemistry instructor always put it was, they're not going to be happy atoms unless they have those outer electron shells filled. Having a full outer electron shell really makes that atom happy and content. Those, of course, are um, anthropomorphized ways of thinking about it. The atom is not actually going to feel happiness or contentment, um, but it just helps you to understand these concepts better. So the interactions that occur um, result in atoms staying close together. And atoms are held together by chemical bonds. I'm going to go over the three major types of chemical bonds that are important for this class. So when an atom loses or gains electrons, it becomes electrically charged. So any charged atom is going to be referred to as an ion. And ionic bonds are formed between oppositely charged ions. So if you've heard the phrase opposites attract, it really applies to oppositely charged atoms here. So for example, sodium and chlorine atoms, which make up common table salt. Um, sodium can donate an electron to chlorine and complete chlorine's outer shell. So both atoms will have complete outer shells and be quote unquote um, content atoms. 
Okay, I'm going to stop here and pick up